Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, Just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, With that, if you've liked the the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you. Let's take our Bibles now and open up to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, we are returning to our exposition of this marvelous book, and uh, it it has been quite a transition uh, back to that passage. I want to read for us just a, just a section of what we will be covering, but we're going to really go from verses 5 down to 19 today. But for reading, we're going to read verses 5 through 7, kind of captures the essence of what we'll talk about. Beginning in verse 5, this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. Let's pray together. Father, We're reminded today of the psalm where Asaph says, O Lord, when I considered the end of the wicked, when I pondered, when I understood, when I saw their end in the sanctuary, remind us, O God, that despite what could be seen on the surface, despite the power of the present age and the present rulers of this age, despite whatever cosmic forces we may face, if anything, this passage reminds us that Assyria and every other wicked nation and wicked person will have an end, and oh, what an end that will be. And so remind us, Lord, to take refuge beneath the shelter of your salvation, your redemption, the cross that has been lifted up so that in lifting up the Son of God and looking upon Him, we may be saved. So, Father, we pray, instruct us today that no matter how bleak, how dark it may seem at times in the world around us, no matter how insurmountable the enemies of the faith may appear, as it has always been, Throughout redemptive history, we know that your redemption will triumph nonetheless. And so, God, remind us today, instruct us, and encourage us as we ponder your victory in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Man, you may be seated. And as you are seated, I will remind you that throughout the history of special revelation, And let me just pause to say how wonderful it feels to preach in front of a church. Camera's great. Dylan's great behind the camera. But this is a lot better. Thinking about the history of Revelation, because throughout the history of Scripture, uh, his people have often been forced to tremble, to fear, even bewilderment in the face of God's judgment. God's judgment. Uh, Just to illustrate this, turn in your Bibles, I'll give you a little time, Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9, because such was the case with one prophet, Ezekiel, a vision that he had seen that depicted the total destruction of Jerusalem, beginning with its priests, wow, beginning with the religious people. God had decreed such an exhaustive destruction that it left the prophet Ezekiel shaken, even questioning God. Beginning in verse 3, 
Ezekiel chapter 9, you kind of see this. It really captures the emotion of what it must have felt like during the 8th century, during the time of Isaiah, during the reign of Hezekiah, and during this period in the southern kingdom of Judah, when the people are seeing God move with such extraordinary force, with such extraordinary judgment, that no doubt every Jew in the land felt like Ezekiel. Verse 3 says, Then the glory of the Lord of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. This is a vision that Ezekiel seen. And he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case. The Lord said to him, Go throughout the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst like God marking out his people. And to the others, he said in my hearing, go throughout this, through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark, and you shall start, where? From my sanctuary. This is like the reverse of the Antichrist in Revelation. Interesting, isn't it? So they started with the elders who were before the temple, and he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. Thus they went out and struck down the people in the city, and they were striking the people, and I alone was left, i.e. Ezekiel. I fell on my face, and I cried out, Alas, O Lord God, are you destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out your wrath on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Judah is very great. Here is God now reasoning with the prophet. It is very great, very, very great, he says. And the land is filled with blood, and the city is full of perversion. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. But as for me, my eye, that is the Lord, my eye will have no pity, nor will I spare, but I will bring their conduct upon their head. This is exactly what is happening in Isaiah chapter 10. This is God visiting upon the nation, sometime before Ezekiel, visiting upon the nation with an evil power, his judgment. And it may appear from the human perspective that God is out of mercy, that God is out of salvation, that his arm does not reach, that God is out of mercy, that God is out of control. So much so that the prophet has to interrupt God in the midst of the vision and say, Alas, O Lord, as this to say, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you destroy everyone in the remnant of Israel. Remarkable. Remarkable. But this wouldn't be the end, as Ezekiel goes on to show in Ezekiel 11, the salvation of the Lord would still prevail. Such was the emotion of the nation at this time. No doubt in the sight of all of this impending judgment, the attitude at this time would have been nothing more than doom and gloom. Remember, go back to chapter 8, verse 22 of Isaiah. That was the end. Of, that's kind of like the picture that is left to us. Doom and gloom everywhere. The whole nation now languishes under the judgment of their sin and the hopelessness of an uncertain future laid waste by the certainty of war. Judgment was always, or judgment always has that effect, uh, there will always be those who will not understand why God is acting in judgment as he is. 
But if we hear from God's perspective, from the divine perspective, we understand that judgment has always been the consequence of sin. And it has never been anything else. Remember, the abomination of, the, of Jerusalem is very, very great. And so, in our own day and age, where we live in a world that believes it can sin with impunity, and the needle on the Creator's wrath does not move at all. That's the world's perspective. Everyone is like Stalin, raising their fist at God, believing that there's no retribution to be feared, no day of judgment coming, no day of reckoning, no account to be given. That's the way everyone lives. But they're wrong. The case can be made that what we are seeing today in the present pandemic, just to use our context, is a result of God's wrath in general because we're told in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is being poured out against all unrighteousness, all ungodliness of man. And maybe we can say that this is the wrath of God being poured out specifically on a whole catalog of sins throughout the world. It's almost like God brings in a providential wrath like this to show that his great displeasure at what the world is, the sin of the world. I mean, I think we're kind of numb to it. We're numb to the fact because we could ask, what sin? Specifically, what sin? Maybe perhaps the millions of aborted image bearers who have been murdered in the name of convenience. Let's start with that sin. Or how about the fact that the total obliteration of any kind of sexual norms in society, even the destruction of the family unit itself, one liberal policy after another. Globally, if you want to take the context, you say, well, you don't measure the kingdom by what happens in the United States. Okay, fair enough. But do you understand we're living in a time right now where there is more slavery globally today than ever before on planet Earth? Do you know that? There is more slavery right now. It's funny. Some of you have seen on my videos at UNT and things, people bring up the issue of slavery. What about slavery in the Bible? I say, well, you care so much about slavery. What are you doing about slavery today? There's more today than ever before, especially when you take in sex trafficking. What sin? Oh, no. The world has committed great abominations, and God is displeased. I think the worst thing I ever heard on the television in the midst of this pandemic is Franklin Graham, of all people, on Fox News, telling people, God is not angry with man right now. He loves them. What are you talking about, Franklin? I mean, I don't even think Billy Graham would have said that. Anyway, God is not angry with man right now? Well, try that on Psalm 5, right? God is angry all the time with the wicked, or wherever that psalm is. Still, the drama in Israel at this point draws us, draws us into the conflict that goes on when the judgment of God appears. Israel has this very simple choice. They are put in a position where the only recourse now is to trust God. They are totally without hope, and their only hope is God. Brothers and sisters, this is the attitude that you and I should have anyway all the time, that God alone is our hope, that we place our hope in nothing else in this life. You know, um, Isaiah is a genius. He is a master in the prophetic literature. He is a master of painting pictures, very vivid imagery that he uses to sort of convey God's will. And in this section, Isaiah gives us three different pictures, we could say, of the wrath of God, of the justice of God, and of the redemption of God. Maybe the redemption part's a little hard to see if you look at what's going on in verses uh, uh, 5 to 19. But let's begin with the wrath of God. The rod of God's wrath. And you find that there in verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the, the people of my fury. So, so this, is, this is what the, 
the purpose of this nation was. It was to be the wrath, the anger of God. As a matter of fact, the amazing translation that's given here, but what they are are literally the staff in whose hands is God's indignation. It's a perfect word picture because on the one hand, it's something in God's hand, and the other, and on the other hand, 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 the other hand, it's also what's in the Assyrians' hands. It's the same thing, wrath. It's wrath. God is moved with fury. God will judge his people. And in this section, what is in view is God, notice the language, I send it against a godless nation. So this is God unleashing this wicked, evil kingdom against his own kingdom. Against his own kingdom. Now, it seems historically that Isaiah here is thinking of a time beyond Ahaz. So if you're even keeping an eye anywhere on the chronology of the book of Isaiah, it seems as if now uh, Isaiah is thinking about the reign of Hezekiah because in verse 11, he mentions the fall of Samaria. That took place after Ahaz, and so he's probably moving forward. It's just, this is what makes the prophets so impossible at times to interpret because it's kind of like, when did this happen and who reigned at that time and what was going on in Israel and Judah? There's two kingdoms and the answer is usually yes. <laughs> so it's kind of like you got to keep your eye on a lot of factors here. But the gist of it is this. It's not so much the chronology of what's going on, but why this is happening. Why is this happening? It's because God is moving to purge and to purify his people. We'll come back to that point. In the sovereign judgment of God, he ordains that the wicked be the ones that do his bidding. And although the divine oracle, notice how verse 5 begins, whoa, this is a pronouncement of judgment. Jesus did this, remember? Woe to the scribes and Pharisees. This is when a prophet wants to speak of a coming judgment of God. And here, he's pronouncing a judgment on his people that his, this evil kingdom of Assyria is going to be the weapon of choice that God uses to move against his wayward people, this, the, the, the people of his fury. And again, this is nothing less than God making good on his promise. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 and following, where God promised that if they engaged in covenant breaking, and how do you know when covenant breaking has reached the point where God can't tolerate it anymore? It's kind of like this. If a, a, a Jew, let's say after the ratification of the old covenant, follow me please, after the ratification of the old covenant at Sinai, if a Jew had a sinful thought, did that break the covenant? No. No. Deuteronomy 18 seems to make it clear that what were what would constitute covenant breach, covenant breaking, ultimately will be symbolized by idolatry, and that is certainly where Ezekiel. Uh, excuse me, this is certainly where Israel and where Judah. This is where they've reached. Their idolatry is going to be mentioned later on in the text. But uh, as a, as a consequence of that, Deuteronomy 28 had promised that I, that God would give them over to a nation that whose language they don't even understand. Total fear, total confusion, total chaos in this way. Therefore, God uses the wicked uh, uh, for righteous ends. From the angle of the nation's sins, God was simply giving the people over to their own devices. If wickedness is what they wanted, then wickedness is what they would get. An avalanche of wickedness. And although in the end it will deprive them of the very thing that they sought because what they wanted was safety, security, and satisfaction in their wicked ways, even their wicked alliances. would we'll come back to backfire on them, of course. But while God's purpose is to display his displeasure, the evil kingdom does not see it this way. And that's, this is kind of the razor's edge that we're walking here in this chapter. It's kind of like God is moving in judgment through the Assyrians, but within the context of that providence, Assyria sees it a different way. They, they see the providential events that are unfolding around them as evidence of their own power, their own ability to destroy and to cut off the nations. Amazing. One commentator said, all that Assyria and its kings has in mind is to destroy nations with surpassing ruthfulness, or excuse me, ruthlessness. 
He boasts of the greatness of his power, that's the king of Assyria, his commanders, that is the officials who serve in the military, military leaders, hold power that is equivalent to kings. Because that's what he says in verse, oh, I don't know, verse 7 or 8. Verse 8 says, are not my princes all kings? What is that saying? What's that saying is that from the perspective of Assyria, its army, its military is so powerful, every leader in the military is like a king over his own province, you see? I'm saying God is taking, isn't it amazing? You have some ambiguous ruler that's not even recorded in history. We don't know who all these princes and these kings and military leaders and commanders were. We don't know their names anymore. But God took notice of every single one of them and their pomp and their pride and their arrogance. It all came before him. He didn't forget any of it. As for the king of Assyria, the string of of events that led to the weakening of the northern kingdom, that's Israel, and the susceptibility of the southern kingdom, that's Judah, was an opportunity for its own imperial ambitions. That's why you have this catalog of nations. Look at verse 9. Uh, is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpath? Is not Samaria like Damascus? I'm sure you guys all know all these cities, right? <laughs> the point is, is that in every region surrounding the kingdom of God, all these nations that surrounded it, all of them, one by one, fell to the power of Assyria. Can you see how the Assyrians became prideful in the midst of that? They're just dominating one village after another, one one culture after another, one language after another. They're just totally laying waste to everybody. At this time, we're thinking of the Assyrian king, Sargon. And maybe some of the destruction that's in view here relates to Shalmaneser and to Tiglath-Pileser as well. These are the kings of Assyria. So we're looking at the span of a few, maybe two, maybe two decades of kings that are reigning at this time. Assyria saw all of these conquests as evidence of personal success, victories that would expand its kingdom. Ooh, brothers and sisters, here is a crucial hermeneutical key for you. Keep your eye out in the Bible any time there's a competing kingdom involved. God will have no competing kingdoms, see? When it comes to this level, the expansion of a kingdom, what does Daniel see? Kingdom after kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And each one of those, what does he see? He sees God breaking those kingdoms down until the final Antichrist kingdom that God will destroy with the coming of his messianic ruler, Jesus Christ. Now, to present uh, the present oracle here reminds us that to be God's rod, to be his axe, because later on in verse 15, that's what Assyria is called. It's like a chopping axe, like a club to beat somebody with. To be God's instrument in his hand was not to be mistaken for glory of any other kingdom except the true kingdom of God. Even in judgment, God's supremacy and his lordship was to remain preeminent. So God's interests here are invested with his own justice being met. This is the Lord's work, because that's what he says in verse 12, when my work is finished. Look at work, verse 12. So it will be that when the Lord has completed all of his work, This is the work of the Lord. This is not the work of Assyria, ultimately. But we come to the next thing, and the next picture that's given here is not just of an evil empire, a cosmic ruler who is used in the hand of God to execute his justice, to execute his judgment, but also, therefore, there is then the humbling, the humiliation of the haughty, the humiliation of the haughty. Assyria, the rod of of his anger, the instrument of God's wrath, will come to feel the power of God's judgment. Isaiah opts for using the title here, sovereign, as opposed to Yahweh. Look at verse 12. So it is, in verse 12, that when the Lord, that's the word that means sovereign one, not Yahweh, but when the sovereign one, the sovereign of hosts, has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. 
he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. The humbling of the king comes right at the proper time. It is met at a time when the king boasts his great blasphemies. And in this way, the king of Assyria will become very antichrist in his boast because he will actually go so far as to expose himself, really what is in his heart. He will believe that Jerusalem is just like any other nation to be toppled, to be destroyed because Jerusalem, like every other nation, is just an idolatrous nation. Look at, it, look at what it says. Verse 10. This is the king of Assyria speaking. As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of idols, whose graven images were greater than those in Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I, that's the king of Assyria talking, shall I not do to Jerusalem as her images just, uh, and her images just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? Wow. So as far as the king of Assyria is concerned, Jerusalem is an idolatrous nation just like everybody else. And he toppled Samaria, and so why not topple Jerusalem? There's nothing. What's the point here, guys? What's the point? Write it down. There's nothing special about Jerusalem. And that's where God intervenes. Right at that point, where arisen in the heart of the king of this evil empire is a blasphemous boast that strikes directly against God's redemptive purposes. Because the purpose of God here in all of this destruction is not to wipe out the remnant completely. That's not what he's going to do. He didn't do it in Ezekiel's time. He's not going to do it here because we know based on well, just the theology of Isaiah that a remnant will return. And that that remnant is very important for the purpose of God because if we go to even in Romans chapter 9, the remnant of, of, of the book of Isaiah is ultimately a symbol of the elect of God. And God does not move against his elect, not in judgment, not in destruction. And therefore, in order to maintain the proper typology, the proper symbolism, he will not allow an evil kingdom to replace his typological kingdom on earth. And so he moves against Assyria right at this time. Shall I not do to Jerusalem as her, and her images, just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? E.J. Young, this commentator, great commentator, he says that the king of Assyria designates the holy Yahweh of hosts an idol. What he's saying is that all the gods that are found in Jerusalem, they're no different than any other pagan gods. This whole Yahweh worship is no different. It's almost as if the king overstepped his purpose. That's to understate the matter, of course, but because in reality, from the divine perspective, the king of Assyria began to take matters into his own hands. The evil ruler now sees Jerusalem as deserving the same treatment as any other pagan nation. And if Samaria can fall and they trusted in Yahweh, why not conquer Jerusalem as well? But this is where the boast will end. The events transpire in such a way that they're full of irony, really, because only Yahweh will determine the extent of his wrath. With the king of Assyria, what, what he missed was that in the midst of all of this desolation and all of this destruction, what was unfolding before his eyes and before the eyes of the whole world was actually divine wrath, but it was a divine wrath of righteousness. Look with me, folks, to verse 22. Verse 22. Right after he gets done talking about the promise of a future remnant, he says at the end of verse 22, a destruction is determined. What? Overflowing with righteousness. That is not what's coming from the hand of the king of Assyria. It's not overflowing with righteousness. What a lesson for us to learn today, brothers and sisters, even as persecution is rising all around the world, and it is, and the people of God seem to be endlessly oppressed, and they are, yet they are not forsaken. Not a single drop of blood from the most forgotten martyr is ever overlooked by God. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. And though no one lament them, and though they may only maybe appear on the back of some unknown, unread newsletter, some missions agency somewhere, yet we are assured that God is the avenger of all of his little ones. Better that a millstone be hung around your neck than you cause one of these little ones to stumble. Now, I want you to turn to the New Testament because sometimes we get this mistaken. No matter how many times we drill it into our minds, no matter how many times we reiterate this, no matter how many times we talk about this, the God of the old and the God of the new are the same God. But somehow, maybe practically speaking, we tend to really diminish that reality. Even in our own minds and hearts, we don't really feel that way. But to avenge his people, we turn not to another bloody episode in the Old Testament, but now we turn to the New Testament. And let me give you two texts that, in fact, seem like they fit right into the Old Testament. Philippians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 28, uh, the Apostle Paul is going to give this encouraging reminder to the church. In no way, let's put it in imperative Form, in no way be alarmed by your opponents because their persecution is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from the Lord. What does he mean by that too from the Lord? Do you catch that part? No throwaway words in the Bible, guys. No, no throwaway sentences, no throwaway prepositional phrases, no throwaway clauses, nothing. Everything has meaning. And when Paul says, and that too from the Lord, he is saying both persecution and salvation is accounted for by God. It is all his doing. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. This is what everything in the Old Testament is pointing us to. Everything. Those Old Testament wars, those Old Testament judgments, those Old Testament desolations, the, the, the language of God's coming wrath, the language of God's coming retribution, all of that language is typological, don't you see? And pointing us forward to the ultimate wrath, the ultimate judgment, the ultimate vindication of God. That is the vindication that comes through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verse 6 says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. That's significant, by the way, because um, the saints in Macedonia, they were really exemplary themselves. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 8? They were an example of giving out of poverty and Remember, they, 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 that's a good church. The Macedonian churches are good churches. And here, we're told that the Thessalonians became a model for them. So Thessalonians were doing a lot of things right. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Uh, no, 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 this is, I'm sorry. This is the wrong text. This is the wrong text. Boy, that was some good theology, though. Second Thessalonians, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Second Thessalonians, but hey, that one was for free, so enjoy that. Now my mind's trying to think how to paste these things, these, this mind burp together. How about I just read Second Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verse 6, where we should have started. And it's a passage that you should remember because we preached this recently. For after all... It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. And now comes the judgment. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire 
dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't end there. These will pay. You can almost hear the prophet Isaiah saying this. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When? When He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed, was believed. Again, the Lord moves to humble the pride of Assyria. Why? Because it boasts of its power. It boasts of its wisdom. And listen, folks, it boasts of its globalism. Turn back to Isaiah 10 so I can show you this. For, Isaiah says, by the power of my hand my, my, and, and by my wisdom, I did this. For I have understanding. I have removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. By the way, if you're interested in biblical history, this is the first time that a kingdom has done something like this. The conflagration of all these nations and languages and cultures. What is he doing there? He's bringing all these nationalities and languages together into their own kingdom. No. He says, like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. My hand reached to the riches of the peoples like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. Wow. What does that remind you of? And there was not one that flapped its wings or opened its beak or chirped. Is the axe, God says, to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it. Or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. In the end, the boast of the king of Assyria proved to be, listen carefully, the antichrist ambitions of a worldwide false kingdom. He then falls in league with all the other cosmic rulers who have attempted to invert the kingdom ambitions of the sovereign God of heaven. So we see this with Nimrod and Babel. We see this in the king of Assyria Later in the book of Isaiah, we're going to see this again with the king of Babylon in chapter 14. Those who are found throughout the book of Daniel, like Persia and Rome, and ultimately the final Antichrist himself, who will stop at nothing until he achieves global supremacy. Thus, we are thinking about eschatology. Isaiah's situation in the 8th century, because that's where we are, 8th century B.C., already begins to declare the final victory of God and the messianic kingdom at the eschaton. What a glorious and triumphant and unshakable kingdom we have. Brothers and sisters, I want to redirect our attention a little bit here with our final point. Because we're looking at a lot of judgment, a lot of wrath, a lot of destruction. But my final point is this final picture that is given by Isaiah, and it's this, that out of the embers, or excuse me, that the embers of redemption, kind of, I'm using the language out of Isaiah, arise out of the flames of judgment. Because it's almost like Isaiah ends the whole section, and and what you're supposed to see in your mind's eye is like a picture of a forest that has been burnt down to the stumps, Nothing is left, just a couple smoldering ashes here and there. There's no trees left. A little child can go and count how many trees are left in the wilderness. They're complete, like a nuclear bomb that has gone off. And yet, if we have eyes to see, it is out of that destruction, and it it is out of that forest fire of desolation that comes the embers of redemption. From the perspective of the wicked... The Lord is an enemy destroyer, but from the perspective of the righteous, he is light 
pure light and all that he does is good. Look back to verse 16 because this is perfect symmetry now. Don't lose your focus here. Look at verse 16. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease against his stout, among his stout warriors. Now, the reason I say symmetry, put your finger on verse 16 and look back at verse 6. To begin things off in this oracle, God first sends this evil kingdom against his people. And then now in verse 16, God will send yet another delegation, this time judgment against that evil kingdom itself. And under his glory, a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. And the light of Israel, that's God, will become a fire and his Holy One a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns, his briars in a single day. And he will destroy the glory of his forests and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away. Here's another metaphor. And the rest of the trees of his forest will be so small in number that a little child could write them down. Beautiful imagery, masterful pictures, incredible metaphors. And really, if you think about it, these are, these are metaphors of of Edenic qualities because it's almost like there's Assyria at the top of, you know, at the heyday of his power, the heyday of his conquest and of his might, building this paradisical environment, building this Edenic garden of paradise all around itself, thinking that it has to do with his own glory, but in the end it will waste away, in the end it will burn down, and that is where redemption comes in. Is it any surprise that the next verse begins with redemption? Now in that day, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them. They'll never again make alliances with the world. Brothers and sisters, what is the identity of the church? One of the central factors, one of the baseline Uh, 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 elements that make up our identity in Christ is that we are what? We are not of the world. We are not to love the things of the world. That we are to come out of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are to remove the evil one from our midst to be a pure people, a pure nation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, you will be separate. You will not be unequally yoked. If you come out from the midst of them, then I will bless you, he says. Remarkable. This whole purging, this whole sanctification that is going on in Israel is enigmatic of our sanctification, of the purity of the church today, of God's kingdom. And so let me end this by saying that Isaiah's message of hope is found here from a history of destruction. And there's different places that we can find this. Number one, again, by understanding that this is the Holy One of Israel. He becomes a flame. He purifies His people. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. So that, in other words, Paul reminds us that it does no good for the people in Isaiah's time and it does no good for the people in our time to complain about the deplorable state of affairs around us no matter what, both Israel and the church are expected to be separate, to be distinct, where we don't blend in. I am afraid too much of the church, too much of our own lives simply blends in with the world. We're so good at it. Can you believe there's ministry manuals that are written to teach the church how to look more like the world? You do the same kind of music, you dress the same, you act the same, you drink the same, You dress, you know, you get the same fashions, the same look, everything. We're just experts at blending in right with our world, contextualizing ourselves away until there's no distinction whatsoever. 
And I know it's a fine line, and I'm riding a razor's edge, and I know it's like I need a parachute right about now. But you know what I'm saying? It's, man, everything is conditioned to make the unbeliever feel a seamless transaction, a seamless transition going from the outside of the church into the church. It all feels the same. From the U2 concert to the church concert. It's all the same. These are, you know, these are groovy tunes. I mean, listen, I love groovy tunes. <laughs> Is the word groovy even relevant anymore? <laughs> I like good music, okay? Don't get me wrong. Uh, I listen to a lot of incredibly you know, uh, contemporary type. I like all that stuff, but what all I'm saying is that have we made some mistakes? Do we look just like the world? Now, brace yourself, guys, but I'm just questioning yourselves, okay? Was it God's will for the church to tattoo itself, drink itself, and smoke itself away? Was it? I don't know about that. I wonder about that sometimes. Is that what the church was supposed to do in its sanctification? Is that how we were supposed to contextualize ourselves, be relevant to the culture, look like them, dress like them? Look, I don't believe tattoos are a sin, so don't attack me after church, okay? Robert, I love you. <laughs> You're not supposed to talk during the sermon. I I'm there, I'm there. No, I was at a conference once with Todd Friel and uh, Phil Johnson, and one of the preachers, this was about a decade ago, one of the preachers came out and <laughs> literally condemning tattoos to sin. And uh, it, was, uh, it was just meltdown time. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not doing that. I'm just questioning. I'm with you here. And I'm just asking, what's the difference between us and them anymore? What's the distinction? You know, when you look at the book of Acts, when you look at, when you look at Paul in the early church, it's like the unbelievers knew that they were among the church. And so much so that they were afraid to identify with them. It was taboo. And I think much of that was because of its consecration. I think much of that is because of its otherworldliness. I think much of that is because of 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so, brothers and sisters, God sees his wayward nation, they don't even look anything like that anymore. Nothing pious about Israel. The same entertainment, the same immorality, the same debauchery, the same excess, the same materialism, the same everything. Nothing different. What, so you put some locks on your hair and you dress a little different? Who cares? That's just not enough to consecrate you. The other thing here is also where we can see this redemption rising is that whatever is spoken of Assyria and what it will do to Judah, nevertheless, the emphasis falls on what God will do to Assyria afterwards so that brothers and sisters never forget that in the midst of all that we see around us, because at times it could just seem like we suffer right along with the world. But don't forget, brothers and sisters, that in the end, God is going to defeat his enemies. And his enemies are our enemies. Paul says, anyone who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Where is that in the church today? It's the last time you read a book that was written on that verse. Don't love the Lord Jesus. You are accursed from God. <laughs> I doubt any popular publishers will want to pick up your manuscript. They may not want to even publish the book of Romans anymore. Finally, brothers and sisters, God has already made it clear. Judgment is so thorough that there is going to come a day when the Holy One of Israel alone will be exalted. Oh, this is where you and I can relish in what's going on here. If you're a Calvinist, <laughs> if you're God-centered, 
<laughs> if man is not at the center of the universe, you can rejoice that at the end of the day, God alone will be exalted. It will be God alone who will be magnified. And if you have a, a, a man-centered worldview, <laughs> you're in trouble. Because it's only those that can appreciate that, quote John Piper here, we are going to be the most satisfied when we see God most glorified. That's when we're going to be at our optimum existence. Don't you see? What is heaven? Heaven is where God rises above and is exalted above everyone and everything else, and we love to have it so. That's what heaven is. And that's what Isaiah reminds us over and over and over again. It will come a day when that will happen. But there's one last thing. Pastor Lynn, can I one more point? I know I'm going long, but I wanted you to see this. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 19. Isaiah 19. Something that should cause us to leap out of our skin happens in this passage. Something that should cause us to have an out-of-body experience. If you're a Jew and you're reading this, you kind of slap yourself. What? I mean, I thought I understood what Isaiah was talking about. I thought I had a handle on Isaiah's message, his preaching, his theology, his teaching, but not this. Because there's one more layer of redemption that happens in this broader theology that Isaiah is unleashing. And you know what it is? It is the gospel. It is the revelation of the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is that God is redeeming for himself a people. Can you define people for me? He is redeeming for himself a people comprised of what? Every nation, tongue, nationality, every ethnos, every kind of person. God is saving for himself an entire array, a whole new humanity. And that new humanity appears right here on the pages of Isaiah's own prophecies regarding these very things. Look at Isaiah chapter 19, verse 23. Isaiah say, what? In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. That's who we've been talking about. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. God is so good. It'd be enough if God just, you know what, Assyria, you became prideful, you became boastful, you became antichrist, you became vaunted in your boast, and I just wipe you off the face of the, of the map, wipe you off the face of the earth. There's not even a trace of you left in, in the history of humanity, you're gone, you're annihilated, you're done with, but that is not the gospel, is it? The gospel is that God is the God who saves. The gospel is the God that God saves who, brothers and sisters? His friends? His buddies? You've heard me say this before. God does not save people that like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter and Snapchat and all that. He saves his enemies. He saves those that hate him, the Egyptian, the Assyrian. Oh, God is so good. That should have been in the verse. Oh, well, I don't want to say what should have been, but you know what I mean. That's what Isaiah is saying. God is this good that even our most dreadful enemies in the book of Zechariah, I think it's Zechariah chapter 9, Eventually, even the Philistine will become a chieftain among the clans of Egypt. It's one of those texts that just say, God saves the worst, the least, the last. Let's pray together. Father, we who sit here and stand here today, we were 
the least, the last, the worst, the chief of sinners. We were your enemies. We were those who were hostile in heart and in mind. We were those who spited you, spurned you. We were those who dwelt in the counsel of the ungodly, sat in the seat of the scoffer. That's who we were. And yet you reached down and we heard the sound of sovereign grace. And Lord, because of your sweet grace, we understand thankfully for your people, judgment is not the last word. And there is such a great, marvelous redemption ahead of us. Help us to be useful, Lord, in your kingdom. We know that you have a means to your end. We know that there is an elect that will be saved, and we desire to be the means, the contour through which that gospel that can save that people We want to be used for that. Help us, O Lord, in our witness. Like Isaiah, help us not to complain at the events unfolding around us, but to know that we're still called to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation. That can only happen as we put our hope fully upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, Just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, With that, if you've liked the, the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you.